Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Monday Night Lecture Series. It's a pleasure to be here. Tonight is a fly fishing evening. My name is Deirdre Brennan, and I produced and directed a film, Atlantic Salmon Lost at Sea, which had its premiere at the Explorers Club. Last August, I was a host for an Explorers Club salmon evening. It was a great success, and we had over 100,000 people from around the world watching. Clearly, salmon and fly fishing are captivating topics. Our guest speaker tonight, Guido Rar, was on last year's panel where he spoke about Pacific salmon and the conservation efforts to save them. Guido is a leader of the Wild Salmon Center in Portland, Oregon. Over the last 30 years, he was part of a group of fly fishermen who explored Russia's Far East and opened it to fly fishing. The book which I have here is about Guido's passion and his quest to save wild salmon. It's an inspiring story and I highly recommend it. Tonight, Guido will take us on an adventure to the Russian Far East in search of the giant taimen, the oldest salmon species in the world. Welcome, Guido. There'll be a Q&A at the end of the evening, so please post any questions you have in the chat box and we'll answer them at the end. Let's watch a short film, River Tigers, to start off our evening. The rumors were appearing, little glimmers of stories, and almost like stories of dragons from the edge of the world. We were hearing stories of fish up to 150 pounds. You know, I heard stories about people seeing ducks floating down the river, and then, boom, out comes this impossibly big fish. If the rumors were true, we needed to get on that river. We needed to find out what was going on biologically. about the big taimen from Russians. And they said, Guido, there's this river called the Tugur, this way in the wilderness of the Russian Far East. And the taimen get to be so big that they attack and feed on adult salmon. <laughs> I was like, you've got to be kidding me. The Russian Far East is the last frontier. It's the last place where you've got entire, intact, healthy salmon watersheds. But change is coming. We also heard that the river was getting hit hard by industrial scale poaching up and down the river. And we know that the biggest fish are the first ones to go. We really needed to get to some of these rivers to find out if the taimen had survived the poaching. I heard a rumor about a Russian scientist that was also a fly fisher in the Russian Far East. People said, you've got to meet Dr. Skopets. It should be good as well. Yeah. Both sides are fine. OK, so we'll see, we'll see. He's not only Russia's first fly fisherman, but he's a field scientist that's discovered new species of salmonid fish all over the Russian Far East. And he disappears into the wilderness and comes back at the end of the field season with amazing new discoveries. So Skopets is kind of like the Indiana Jones of wild salmon. My father took me fishing when I was five years old. Since that time, I understood that it's what I want to do in my life. And I don't want really to do anything else except fishing. I grew up with a fishing rod in my hand. 
my grandfather and my aunts and uncles fished, so I grew up fishing. So it's really a remarkable opportunity to integrate yourself into the ecosystem, and there's very few things quite like fly fishing. I was about 28 or 29 years old, and I did see the salmon and steelhead runs were declining dramatically. I knew that we were at risk of losing these miraculous fish, and it really hit close to home. And I decided to really focus my life then on salmon and steelhead and trout conservation and trying to protect them. The Tagore is one of the most remote watersheds left in the world. It is one of the last truly wild salmon rivers. The river goes on for hundreds of miles of endless braids. It's like a labyrinth of channels. It cuts back and forth, creating this mosaic of different kinds of habitat for all these different species of fish. First time, I was here in the year 2001. We were dropped by helicopter about 100 uh, kilometers from here. A small rubber raft, some gear, nothing really, no luxury. And he came back with stories of giant taman. It was the first time I was able to catch good-sized taman with a fly. A taman is a member of the Salmonid family. This is the family that has all the trout, Atlantic salmon, the Pacific salmon, and the taman. But they're really just a huge predatory trout. It's one of the oldest salmonids which are still existing. The last dinosaurs were existing about 60 million years ago. Taman is about 50 million years ago maximum possible length is about two meters. And such fish could weigh probably close to 200 pounds. We could compare this fish with a tiger. It could consume mammals, birds, wild ducks, muskrats, not only fish. It's a top predator. And the predators, they are a very good sign about the system. It's the most vulnerable species. If there is enough uh, tigers in the forest, you could be sure it's a really healthy ecosystem. The same we could say about the river. If there's something wrong with the river, it cannot be a healthy population of time. One of the things that Dr. Skopetz found years ago was there was an incredible epidemic of poaching for salmon. At that time, uh, the Tugur was not in the best shape. They come in and they set up nets. They drag the fish in, they cut the females open, and they grab the eggs, the caviar. And this has become an epidemic. On this river, there were poachers on supposedly on every gravel bar, and the salmon runs were declining, and it was crazy. And then the river was discovered by a powerful Russian businessman named Alexander Abramov. At that point, an extraordinary thing happened on the Tagore. Abramov decided, you know what? I'm not gonna allow this poaching on this river. He kind of sees this as his river. So he and his men work with local law enforcement. They conducted any poaching patrols and they stopped the poaching on the Tagore. And basically saved the salmon run. That was like that. People understood, walked away, that's it. 
And so he leased the fishing rights for the Tagore and then built a camp on the river. He knew this would help keep the poachers away. I think that what is important just to realize that uh, some parts of that nature are fragile. And if you just destroy them, there will be no more. I mean, the real question is, can these rivers recover from that level of poaching? Can the giant taman return? That's a key question. If we are able to find some big taman, there's some critical information that we need to learn. We need to know population size. We need to know how long they live. And we really want to find out why these fish get to be so huge. That'll tell us if the river's recovering and that it can recover. And biologically, what we need to do to protect this fish. Fly fishing is one of the best ways to get our hands on a fish without killing it. So we experimented with different kinds of feathers and synthetic materials and different levels of flash and colors. Technique, do you move the fly fast? Do you let it drop? You need to be on the bottom. And I will say that we don't have the answers yet. We spent long days not catching anything in hopes, you know, that lightning will strike. Nice. Ah, he lost it. He broke the hook. Big fish, huh? Mm, not very big fish. 45 pounds. Very fast. Strong, fast, but not, not huge. Not huge. Yeah. We are at the 11th hour for our wild fish. So there's not too many chances left. Very good. All right, we got an issue here. I can't move this fish. He's too big. He's coming. He's coming right now. Oh, awesome. All right, oh, there we go, we got him. Sweet. Look at that. That is a freaking dinosaur. We've now gathered data from hundreds of taman. We can see that the whole ecosystem is being driven by nutrients brought in by the salmon runs. And as the salmon runs have returned, so have the giant taman. Bon voyage. The Tugur is the best one of remaining rivers. The taiman is in great shape, and now we could see how the true healthy salmon river should look. It's about people who are actually doing the same job, trying to protect nature. And I'd like my son to see the same fish like I did, and my grandsons to see the same. And that's the most important part. In this watershed, Alexander personally has protected the forest. He prevented mining. He's chased away the poachers. And all the land around it is going to be turned into one big park because the Russians are just as passionate about wild fish and rivers as we are. This is a true stronghold. And I wish it will be forever.
Terrific. Well, I'm glad you got a chance to see that film. Deirdre, thank you for the introduction and thanks to the Explorers Club for hosting me and letting us show the film. Uh, am I, is my audio coming through? Yep, you're all good. Okay. I, to understand how important the work that Alexander Abramov and his Russian colleagues are doing, you have to appreciate that the Russian Far East is almost a mirror image of North America. And it's a wilderness for the most part that generates half of the world's wild salmon. And they're further back in the develop the pattern of development and habitat destruction that has already overtaken salmon runs on this side of the Pacific Rim. So what the Russians have is an extraordinary chance to protect some of the greatest salmon rivers on earth. And you know, there's a lot at stake uh, you know, for indigenous people, for the food security issue, but the threats are real and they're accelerating. So we're at a kind of a critical window of time with Russia. So what I'm gonna do now is describe the work that the Wild Salmon Center and our Russian partners are doing in Russia. And I'm gonna cover really three uh, fields. I mean, there's science and exploration, there's conservation and fly fishing. And I'm gonna tell us the story really of how a group of obsessed fishermen and scientists started working in the Russian Far East and help protect some watersheds and open the door to a number of things that are good for the environment. Before I launch my presentation, I wanna recognize the people doing this work uh, on the ground in Russia and in Habarovsk or the Habarovsk Wildlife Foundation led by a man named Alexander Kulikov, a group called Sokolin Environmental Watch uh, based on Sokolin Island led by Dima Lisitsin and an organization based in Moscow called the Russian Salmon Fund. And so gradually the non-governmental sector is growing in strength and capacity and the Habarovsk Cry administration is in the process of moving millions of acres of pristine habitat into their park system. So these guys are the heroes uh, in a very tough environment. I mean, the Russian Far East is kind of like the Wild West. So um, their work is important. Okay, I will now share my screen. So this is, this is all we've got. This is our planet spaceship earth and it's amazing that from space in this miraculous and beautiful thing where we all live we can see what can be described as salmon nation it's this vast and beautiful northern pacific rim that extends from the pacific northwest all across alaska kamchatka and the russian far east at this amazing thing surrounded by a thin film of life and across that vast and beautiful arc that you can see is the Pacific Ocean, which generates most of the oxygen that we breathe. And underneath those clouds that you can see are vast numbers of wild Pacific salmon that basically are the key to the health of all the watersheds that flow into the Northern Pacific Rim. So this is the uh, range of Pacific salmon. And you can see the yellow shows the edge of the marine distribution and how far inland uh, the salmon go on their migrations. And so each year, 500 to 800 million salmon swim into those watersheds, delivering over 1.5 million metric tons of nutrients and breathing life into this vast river system across the North Pacific. And it's the importance of salmon nutrients to all the wildlife and the people and the economies of the North Pacific cannot be understated. That's why scientists call them the keystone species. So this, this massive transfer of nutrient is fundamental to the health of bears and eagles and killer whales. Indigenous people completely depend upon the wild salmon runs that reach that arrive every year. And it's a food security you know, issue for humankind. So the fate of the wild salmon runs is not a marginal issue. It's a fundamental issue for the health of a big chunk uh, of the North Pacific that we can basically see from space. And, and, and aside from its biodiversity and the importance for people, you know, salmon, we live in a world that's increasingly disconnected from nature and crazy fishermen <laughs> you know, and women, all of us, we kind of find solace on the water. We need to hang on to any links we have with the natural world. So. The value of these rivers is important for a lot of reasons and it's also important for our state of mind. So now uh, I'm gonna describe the, the status of wild salmon. Here you can see the Pacific Rim. And in this picture, the yellow 
colors show where the fish are in real trouble and the darker colors show where there's more wild salmon and healthier populations. And what, what's happening is the salmon runs are declining from the south to north pattern of decline. Now I'll go over to, this is Japan. Japan has lost their healthy wild salmon runs and now they depend upon a big system of fish hatcheries. Uh, the vast Amur River Basin which you can see over here in the Russian Far East, the salmon runs are collapsing. Now we're seeing the salmon runs collapse on Sakhalin Island. And the, the pattern tends to be moving north. In the Pacific Northwest, south of Canada, most of the wild salmon runs are now listed under the Endangered Species Act. And we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year to try to bring them back. And now even the Fraser River in Southern British Columbia is seeing collapses of their salmon runs. So what's happening is this pattern is probably not going to, it's probably going to continue. And it's the result of a lot of different factors that range from habitat loss to illegal fishing to changes in the marine environment. Our organization, um, the Wild Salmon Center is not able to deal, to resolve all of those issues. But what we have been working on now for 20 years is a very deliberate strategy to identify and protect the most important salmon rivers, which we call strongholds across the Northern Pacific Rim. And the one thing we've learned from history is if you wait for the damages to a salmon river to happen, if the, once the dams are built or the gold mines are built, it's very hard to recover them. It can be done, but it's, you also have to find the systems that are relatively healthy. And if we can protect them on the front end and prevent the next generation of threats, we might have a chance to deliver some of these systems into the future in their current healthy state. So these are the most important sources of wild salmon biodiversity across the Northern Pacific Rim. And they anchor each section of the Pacific Rim and capture its distinct types of uh, you know, ecological health and salmon and all the species that go with them. And when we talk about salmon, we're also talking about kind of the whole food web and all the things that go with them. So we're working with partners on a three-part strategy to protect the habitat and the fish and build local organizations in each one of these watersheds across the North Pacific. What I'm gonna do now is take you over to the Russian Far East and give you a look at, at some of the work that's happening and some of the threats and also show you some fantastic uh, angling opportunities. So the Russian Far East, I was over, I came over in the early 1990s and met Dr. Skopets, who you met in the film. And during the 90s, I teamed up with a group of Russian and American scientists and fishermen. This is Jack Stanford from the University of Montana on the right. To the left is Kirill Kuzistian, who's a, a a uh, Russian uh, fisheries biologist, a professor of fisheries at Moscow State University in Moscow. Peter Sovrel, the founder of the Wild Salmon Center was one of the explorers. Myself, Misha Skopets, Dmitry Pavlov from Moscow. And we spent, we had 15 years of exploring rivers in the Russian Far East. And this is Dr. Skopets who you met. Misha is an unusual guy. Fascinating. He really is an explorer and a scientist who's made some of the most important discoveries of new species of salmonid fish in Russia. And I'd like to tell one little anecdote that Misha uh, told me that he's published about. He heard a rumor in the 1980s about a, a massive crystal clear lake in Siberia that was a meteor crater. And in this lake, some geologists told Skopets about the lake and he traveled there and he fished and it turns out this lake is so cold that it's only ice free for about a month every summer. So the rest of the year it's frozen over and in this lake he caught some tremendous char. So these are char, it's salvelinus, it's the brook trout family and those are big char, 25 pound char. And so Dr. Scope has discovered this was a new species of char and then he opened them up and in the stomach he found the bones of another not just new species, but new genus of char called Salvithemus, which is a plankton eating char that lives between three and 600 feet deep in the crystal clear depths of this lake. It's called Lake Ilgigitin. And so Scopets discovered the bones from the fish in the stomach of the big predatory char and made one of the great discoveries uh, in the world of salmon and steelhead and all fish. So it's a fascinating experience. And this is the kind of thing that can still happen in the Russian Far East. There's just so much land. So this is Kamchatka on the right, 
a vast peninsula altogether that's almost the size of California. And I'll go first to Kamchatka and describe some of our expeditions. And then we'll go over to uh, the Russian Far East uh, and describe some of the work that's happening there. These orange areas are the strongholds uh, that we're targeting for conservation. So Kamchatka is, it's like almost like the lost world. Uh, there's, there's 300 volcanoes in Kamchatka, 30 of them are active. Sometimes you fly into Kamchatka and you can smell the sulfur from the volcanoes in the, in the cockpit of the airplane. Um, it's a dramatic and remote landscape, very sparsely inhabited that produces an amazing abundance of wild salmon. Roughly 20% of the world's wild salmon just come from Kamchatka and all species. So this is the mouth of a river called the Coal. And I don't know if you can see all those little dots, but those are look like hundreds of seals and sea lions and belugas and other species that are just feeding on the salmon runs that come back into the rivers. When we started traveling over there, uh, we saw Stellar's eagles. And this is the world's largest bird of prey, bigger than a golden eagle and a bald eagle, and that they feed on the salmon. And giant bears, uh, brown bears. I mean, there's thousand pound plus bears in Kamchatka that just get to be obese feeding on the salmon runs. They're generally pretty mellow bears, but still, if you're close to one, you definitely are paying attention. Um, these are the species on uh, in the Russian Far East. And just so you know, the chum and the pink salmon are the big wild salmon. You know, the abundance of wild salmon in the North Pacific is really driven by those top three. And most of the world salmon swimming around in the ocean are chum and pink salmon. The masu is a salmon that's from uh, only from Russia and Japan. It's also called the cherry salmon because they come when the cherry blossoms are blooming. They also turn bright red when they spawn. There's coho salmon. Steelhead are sea run rainbow trout. Chinook are the biggest ones. They get up to 70, 80 pounds. And that's the taimen, uh, which we'll talk about later in the film. And you saw the taimen from the film we just showed. Here's some pictures of char. There's 10 different species of char in the Russian Far East. They're very abundant. This is an Asian white spotted char. The Russians call it the kunja. And that's actually a sea run uh, life history type of the Asian white spotted char. There's Dolly Varden. This is some spawning coloration of a dolly. And uh, I don't think there's few things in nature that are quite as stunning, at least in my view, than the, this coloration. Um, for all of you anglers, I mean, there's tremendous rainbow trout fishing. And the rainbows are just on Kamchatka. And there also is an isolated population on the Shantar Islands off the Russian Far East. But Kamchatka maybe has some of the best, if not the best, wild native rainbow trout fishing in the world. And some of the rivers have rainbows up to 35 inches, you know, 16, 17 pound resident rainbows. Uh, we fish for them often using mouse patterns, which is a jarring experience when one of those comes up for a mouse. Uh, there's, there's steelhead populations in Kamchatka, which are sea run rainbows. And there's an excellent program in northeastern Kamchatka run by the conservation angler to take people steelheading and conducting science. Uh, so Kamchatka, uh, one of the first things we did in Kamchatka was we, let, we actually led expeditions to most of the rivers on the west side of Kamchatka and a lot of them on the east side. And this little tale I'm going to show you was about the exploration of a river called the Krutogorova right here in central Kamchatka, which we decided to float from as far up as we could go and try to find out what was the key to the abundance of wild salmon in Kamchatka. Now, remember in the Pacific Northwest where I live, where most of the salmon are endangered, our rivers are just fragments of what they used to look like when Lewis and Clark came. But going to Kamchatka is almost like going into a, a time machine and looking at river systems in a completely natural, pristine state. And so seeing how these rivers function ecologically provides kind of a window for us to try to understand maybe some of the things that are wrong with our rivers here and help us restore the rivers that we have closer to home. So we flew to the headwaters uh, with a Russian-American expedition. All these expeditions are joint Russian and Americans, of course. And the Russians have some of the best scientists in the world, of course. And so I, it's, this, this is bear country, so I insisted on having a bear dog. And if you have a dog with you, that they start barking when the bears come around and they can chase the bears away. What we ended up with, it looked like a, like a dachshund or something that was 
basically never stopped shaking the entire trip and he was useless with the bears. Turns out we didn't have any real bear problems. The problems we did have were there was miscommunications with the helicopter pilots and we were dropped way too far up in the watershed. And at this point in the headwaters of the Cruda Garova, there was no one river, it was a labyrinth of braids being driven across an alluvial floodplain by log jams. Uh, luckily, we had Jack Stanford in the lead, who is an expert river geomorphologist, so he could somewhat predict where the river <laughs> was going to go next. But we were instantly in a situation where we were weak, uh, you know, upstream. And of course, uh, there was a few other issues. Our radio didn't work, and nor did we have gas for our chainsaw. So it was a dicey couple of days. But we, it was extraordinary. What you, what you know, what were, we were most worried about were. Um, this kind of a situation where the river goes under a log jam. And this is one tributary that goes completely under the log jam. So you definitely will die if you get swept into that thing. In fact, they probably never see you again. So luckily we were able to choose the channels that didn't end in log jams. And the ones that we did get to, we were able to cut our way through. This was a hatchet, look at that. I mean, we had like a little table saw, but we were able to get through the, the, the log jams. And in the process, we discovered some things. So Jack insisted that we walk transects periodically across the floodplain, starting at the top end of the watershed, which we did. And the only way to get around in the floodplain was following the bear trails. And we could hear the bears, we could smell the bears, we come around the corner and there's half the salmon that's just been bitten in half, hardly ever saw the bears, but it, it was just, you know, one of the most terrifying things I've ever done was follow Jack and the Russians through the deep cover of the alluvial floodplain on the Kruta Garova. But what we found was two things, three things really. One is that whole system was being driven by salmon nutrients and we could measure the marine carbon and nitrogen all throughout the ecosystem. And it was like a massive nutrient pump. We took scales off the fish and we could determine how old they were, where the nutrients were coming from that, that made the fish are made up of and be able to identify genetically the different populations within species. And what we found was the key in addition to the nutrient input was the spectacular diversity uh, of fish. Now this is all just rainbow trout and steelhead. And I, and I don't want to get in the weeds of what this means, but those pie charts show all the different types of races of salmon and steelhead within the species, within each river. So what you had is five or six species of salmon and trout and steelhead and char. And then within each species were all these little populations that were genetically distinct. And that was the key to the abundance and the diversity and the resilience of these systems. The third thing we found was the big old growth cottonwood forests were driving the river left and right across the alluvial floodplain, creating this incredible mosaic of different kinds of microhabitats. So we had microhabitats and all these little tributaries. We had a nutrient pump and high diversity. And so the key for recovering salmon to the Pacific Northwest is those three things. And it helped us understand what we need to do to re return our rivers. So now, um, I'm going to leave Kamchatka and take you over to the Russian Far East and show you a few rivers and give you a taste of this amazing landscape. Uh, first, we'll go to the Kopi, which is a, an amazing system that's home to the most ancient type of taimen, the sea run taimen. And then we'll go north to the Tugur. So the Kopi River flows into the Sea of Japan, and it's a mixing zone between boreal and subtropical fauna and species. It has extraordinary salmon runs. It also has species you'd seen in a boreal forest, moose, uh, kind of an Asian uh, Russian version of the elk, um, brown bears, you know, grizzly bears, wolves, uh, forest caribou, and Siberian tigers, all occupying the same forest in the same watershed. And uh, it's an extraordinary thing. I just, it's hard to even imagine bears, wolves, and tigers all being in the same forest together naturally. Um, in addition, there's this ancient species of taimen, which is a type of salmon. It's like a giant trout that swims out to the ocean. Um, it's a, about a 30 million year old species, very rare, very endangered, but the strongest remaining population is in the Kopi River. 
I'm happy to say now that thanks to the, our work with the Russian partners, most of the Kopi is now in protected status, um, which is a good thing. Uh, now I'd like to um, move a little bit north to these watersheds, uh, the Tagore, which the film was based on, and uh, the Maya uh, and the Uda watersheds. Um, flying and exploring, you know, traveling to the different rivers in the Russian Far East, you know, you know for me, it's, uh, it's a very moving experience. Um, I mean, if you've worked in the Pacific Northwest and you've seen how, what a struggle it's been to, to try to put our rivers back together, and it's important work, and, and we're very involved in that. But you don't get to see, you don't get to go back in time. And this river, the Nimalin, is a famous uh, Russian Taman and Salmon River. And what you're looking at is a completely pristine watershed of old growth, ancient trees, rivers, not a single road, not a single trace of human life. And this was taken from the helicopter the last time I was over in Russia, just before COVID. But you fly for all day for 10 hours looking at the same thing without anything. And um, that will change. Change is coming to, to this part of Russia. Uh, the logging leases for a lot of this part of Russia have been sold. Um, there are miners moving in and there's a dramatic epidemic of poaching. So we are in a window of time where we have to work with our Russian partners to help protect as much as we can while we still can, because there won't be other chances to do that. This is it really. Um, this is the Tagore, which is uh, that system that, that you learned about in River Tigers. And I told you about the importance of habitat complexity and floodplain complexity. You can see all the side channels in this system. This is a biological factory here, hotspot. There's a lot of bioproductivity happening here with it being driven, of course, by the salmon runs. Um, of course, the Tagore, the big nutrient link are the chum salmon runs that come in each year. And uh, uh, the other species there from an uh, angling standpoint are, um, this is an Asian trout uh, called a lenoc. It's a different genus, breaking my stacks. It's different from our species over here, but ecologically, it looks like a brown trout. And there are tremendous uh, lenoc fishing in the Russian Far East and on these rivers. Um, they're also delicious. Uh, this is an Arctic grayling. Um, and what we discovered on the Tagore was that when we were on the river, now and then we'd see a, one of these big taimen would, would rise and create a huge explosion on the surface. Uh, and we were wondering, what, was it, what were they doing? Well, now we know that what was happening was there'd be hatches of mayflies in particular, and stone flies and caddises. And the grayling and the lenoc would move towards the surface to feed on the hatches. And those giant taimen were circling underneath and exploding on those fish that were feeding on the hatches. <laughs> so it was, so what we did is, or I tied a pattern uh, that looks like a grayling. This is a tube fly uh, with different types of feathers. And uh, it, 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 and it works the taimen definitely responded to it. And now we're tying them with foam heads so we can get a surface retrieve. And that's what you saw in the film was a surface strike to one of these uh, uh, grayling patterns. So the pop is like the rising for the fly and then you're waiting for the, the big pop of when a taimen uh, comes up. Uh, you know, we fished uh, uh, with our Russian uh, colleagues, you know, for a long time before we started catching these fish, there's not a lot of the time are not like you're catching them left and right. So this was an 84 pound uh, time. In. And, and I that I'd been fishing for four days. And that was my second hookup. So it's fascinating. These big apex predators, I don't know if they're eating everything around them. There's no small time in, but there's not a lot of fish, but you have a chance at a really big fish. Um, every fish now that we're catching, we're basically um, tagging and measuring and gathering biological samples from and scale analysis and creating a living library using something called wild ID where we get photo recognition of the distinct spotting patterns on each fish. And so now we're creating a database on the Tagore and this is gonna be expanded to other rivers where we basically can track every fish uh, over time and get estimates of population size and trends in growth 
and monitor the population. And uh, it's a great way to involve anglers too, because every fish that you catch before you release it, because of course with timing, we release every fish we catch, we gather the data. One of the first things that we found, uh, and this effort was led by our chief scientist, Matt Sloat, is the, you know, the question of why, how do the taimen get so big? Well, of course we think because it's because they're eating salmon. Well, here we measured the carbon and nutrient uh, ratios in their cells in the tissue of the taimen. And they grew about normally, right? Until they got to be 120 centimeters or about 50 pounds. And then when they got big enough to eat an adult salmon, look what happened to the growth ring. And then these really monsters in the 100 pound range are basically made up of salmon nutrients. So it was, uh, we definitely showed the, that those taimen are, are specialists on eating their own uh, members of Salmonidae. And Matt, uh, his second taimen on the Tagore was a hundred pound plus behemoth. I mean, that's, that's Pleistocene megafauna, right? There's still some, some left out there. And that's what you're looking at right there. It's a tremendous fish. Since then, Ilya Sherbovich from the Russian Salmon Fund has caught even bigger fish than that on a fly. And who knows, maybe these fish will just keep growing and growing. That's what that fish did to a three-aught siwash hook. Okay, that's a hook that I couldn't bend if I wanted to. So there, uh, it's a formidable quarry. Um, so basically, this gives you a, you know, a summary of of some of the work happening uh, in the Russian Far East and some of the things we've been doing. Uh, I'll just finish by saying, you know that. that with the advent of climate change, and we're seeing it here in Oregon, we're, we've got, I've measured 71 degree waters in the, our local rivers already. We're expecting fish kills this summer because of the heat wave and the heating of rivers. Uh, we're seeing marine heat waves uh, in the ocean. Um, one thing we can do to, pre to prepare ourselves for the changing world as these rivers begin to heat up is to secure the protection of these centers of salmon diversity and abundance. And in each one of those orange spots are rich diversity of different salmon species and races within those species. And salmon have the ability to, to adapt, but protecting this archipelago of watersheds and securing them for decades, which is what we're doing. We're gonna get, we will get multi-decadal protection of these places. And there'll be groups distributed across the Pacific Rim that will help protect them and defend them. But that's something that we have to do to prepare ourselves. And it's not just for the salmon, but for all the species they connect looking into the future. And this, this, this strategy can work and it's starting to work right now. So all of you who are listening, I encourage you to, um, you know, stay in touch with us. Uh, look up the Wild Salmon Center. We'd love to get you involved. We'd, we'd love your help. And most importantly, don't miss any chances to work with our Russian colleagues who are some of the finest scientists and conservationists anywhere in the world. And Russia, Canada, where we work closely with our Canadian colleagues in North America, we all share this. This is a shared ecosystem. And one that the fate of these systems in, in some ways is maybe more important than many of the other things that we're struggling over. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Guido. How fascinating to learn about uh, Far East Russia and such beautiful rivers and fish. Stats from Habarovsk in Russia are watching tonight, as well as other places in Far East Russia. So welcome. We'd also, we also have people watching from Argentina, all over the US and in Canada. So welcome everybody. Um, so we have a few questions first. Is poaching on the Kamchatka Peninsula and the Russian Far East still a huge problem? Are there other conservations and anglers like Alexander Abramov working to save other Russian rivers? Yes, and so, so, so Russia is, it is a little bit like the Wild West and the rivers are very remote and you have to basically, they're, they're hard to get to and they're hard to patrol. But what's happened is Russia's beginning to get a handle on the poaching epidemic in different places. I mean, we're just beginning. So in Kamchatka, most of the commercial fishing groups have now decided to become, to take upon the anti-poaching 
more as part of their business model. And so the commercial fishing groups are now working with something called the Marine Stewardship Council, which is an independent third party green certifier of fisheries. And so the Russian commercial fishermen are being now mon uh, monitored and evaluated by the Marine Stewardship Council. In return, they are demonstrating sustainability and they're getting access to Western markets. 70% of Kamchatka's commercial fisheries are now certified and the commercial fisheries are now working to reduce the illegal fishing and the poaching. It's a little bit tougher in the Russian Far East mainland, but we're beginning to see uh, help. And now we have new groups like the Russian Salmon Fund who are really taking the con their conservation mission seriously. I'm feeling some, a little bit more optimism now than I, than I have. Great, thank you. Another question. I know governments have their own agendas, but how do you feel working with the Russian people to protect rivers and salmon? Oh, uh, they're the, we're just, they're terrific. I mean, the, the Russian people, the scientists, their conservationists are wonderful, uh, highly educated uh, and super competent, uh, passionate people that, we're quite honored to work with. Terrific. And you did touch upon some of those people in the presentation, so mm -hmm. that was terrific. Can you tell us what's the latest status um, is of Bristol Bay and the Pebble Mine? Is there anything you would like to see the Biden administration do to help save Bristol Bay? Thank you for asking that, Deirdre. So for those, most of you may know this, but Bristol Bay, Alaska is the most important salmon producing watershed on earth. It's the western side of Alaska, just north of the Aleutians. It produces up to 65 million salmon a year. And there's been efforts most recently by a Canadian mining company to build a huge uh, gold and copper mine in the headwaters. And the deposit of ore is so big that it would create a permanent source of pollution for the watershed and really put that whole system at risk. Um, right now, the Biden administration is committed to protecting Bristol Bay. And we're hoping that they move quickly to ask the Environmental Protection Agency to look at the use of uh, the Clean Water Act or other mechanisms to help prevent the next generation of hard rock mining threats to Bristol Bay. So the Biden administration, I'm very confident, um, is gonna move ahead on conservation. And we're really hoping that they put it right to the top of their list uh, of things to do. Great, thank you. Is there any petitions or anything our viewers could could um, do to sign up or help out? No, I just think you can go online at the Wild Salmon Center and learn a lot more, but we're at a great moment right now. And, uh, and I know President Biden is committed to protecting Bristol Bay. Um, Senator Murkowski is also working on a conservation plan for Bristol Bay. So the pieces are moving, but the main thing right now, it really is up to the Biden administration to work with the EPA to see if they can make a durable protection that will last. Another question is from our viewers. Uh, can you talk about the role of indigenous people in saving rivers and salmon? So it's critical and inseparable. So in all the project sites uh, where we were working, there are indigenous groups and there are actually over 40 distinct indigenous groups and th they are the stewards of those watersheds and we're the guests in those watersheds. And our role is to work with them as their guest and to help do everything we can to help secure the long-term protection of those rivers because they are as important, if not more important to the people that have been there for thousands of years. In the Russian Far East, there's Udige, Nanai, Koryak, Evenk. Uh, there are strong uh, First Nations groups in British Columbia, Alaska natives. And so this whole part of the work has been um, really important for the Wild Salmon Center. So thank you for asking. Great. An audience member, Pam Halwell has asked, is Wild ID an app? Oh gosh, I should know that. Any of my children would know that, but I don't know that. <laughs> um, I don't know, but it's, you can Google Wild ID and it's absolutely fascinating um, way that they've started in Africa, identifying you know giraffes and different kinds of large mammals based on the spotting pattern. So you feed the images into the computer and the algorithm detects the same pattern showing up twice. And so it will scroll through all these different, in this case, we're using the face of the Timon with this unique spotting pattern. And each fish has its own distinct spotting patterns that don't change. So uh, it's, it's pretty cool. And so I, the same uh, person asked is, uh, you refer to a mouse pattern. Can you explain? <laughs> 
Okay, on this side of the Pacific Rim, trout are very dainty and they eat mayflies and stoneflies and, you know, if uh, chironomids. Uh, in the Russian Far East, they eat mice and lemmings. Um, so the mouse patterns, there's different patterns, but apparently is mice and other small rodents, um, mice is the wrong word. I think these are lemons and lemmings and voles and shrews swim at, migrate at night and they end up in the river at night. And all those fish are very aware of it. And so the mouse pattern is a fly that imitates a mouse swimming for its life across the surface of a river. Oh, good. Um, let's see. Okay, here's one for you that you may or may not want to answer. What is your favorite river to fly fish on? Oh boy. Um, well, I, any fly fisherman knows that that to be very careful about naming your favorite river because we keep them in <laughs> top secret. But um, oh, my favorite rivers. I mean, how to choose? But I'm, I will say the Tugur is my favorite. I mean, it's it's just spectacular. There, the Tugur and the rivers in Russia have so many layers of mystery that as a fly fisher, you know, half of fly fishing is just trying to learn what's going on in the water and deciphering and tying flies to imitate what you think's going on. And so there's so many levels of mystery on the Tagore that a lifetime could be spent peeling back the, the layers of opacity and mystery, you know? So I'd say it's the Tagore. Very good. And Deborah's asked, are, are salmon farms increasing? Yeah, salmon farms are increasing uh, and they are a threat to wild salmon. Um, and it, it's a real issue. I, I don't think salmon farms are going away anytime soon, but there's a new push to, to do land-based aquaculture and have closed containment land-based systems that don't have the marine impacts that salmon aquaculture in the ocean have. So salmon aquaculture in the ocean creates plumes of pollution and disease and parasites that affect the other salmon swimming by, and it's become a real issue. And so is land-based salmon farming catching on? Or more Started, just, just, just starting to, yeah. Mm -hmm. On the West Coast there, as well yeah. as here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, here's another question. Is there any reason to introduce any of these species from Eastern Russia to Canada or Alaska? <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting idea. Uh, but it's not worked in the world of salmon. Uh, you just can't move them from one river to another. Now, you can introduce wild salmon and steelhead to places where there are none. Like this happened in New Zealand and the Great Lakes, and the species took off. But our efforts to move salmon around in the Northwest has, have, have been a real disaster because the salmon that are native to those rivers have evolved in those systems, and they're like a lock and a key, where the river's the lock and the fish is a key, and they know how to they have all the right teeth on the key to, to survive. And when you start bringing fish in from other places, you can really mess up the genetic uh, integrity of the fishes and, and it, it hasn't worked very well. The other thing about introductions are, you never know what's gonna happen down the road and you can make an introduction and it can explode and then you can completely upset your system and end up with you know, non-target species everywhere and a, and a trophic mess. So, um, it's an intriguing idea, but, um, but, but not one that makes sense in the world of salmon and steelhead. Thank you. From Tom Dietz, was there any toxicological analysis performed, stable water temperatures that can affect spawning? Um, I just lost you for a second. Was, about, oh, was there any toxicological um, test on? toxicological analysis performed, probably on the rivers you're working on in Russia, stable water temperatures or changes that can affect spawning? Oh, great question. Uh, we're monitoring water temperatures and we're gonna set up a really one of those little um, water monitoring stations in the Tugur, but those are things we're looking at right now. Like is water temperature a trigger for spawning, um, changes in water chemistry. Uh, these are mysteries that need to be um, looked at. Terrific. So is there anything else you wanted to um, share with us, Guido, before we wrap up our evening? And thank you again for such a fascinating film and to 
bringing us to a place few of us I'm sure have been to here. So very beautiful rivers, just gorgeous scenery. So let's hope we can protect them. We will, we will. And I just, it's an honor to be here with the Explorers Club, Deirdre, and with you. And thanks everybody for uh, listening to all of our fishing stories. <laughs> thank you, Guido. Okay. And thank you to Ann Passer for organizing and making these Monday night lectures possible. And to Kevin Murphy, who's a wizard behind the scenes orchestrating everything. Good night, everyone. And thank you so much for joining in. And thank you again, Vito. Thank you. Good night, everyone.